The story of the Kandahar Giant was brought to the public's attention in 2016 by American paranormal filmmaker L.A. Marzulli with the film Watchers 10. Despite the fact that it had previously appeared on the American Coast to Coast AM radio show in 2008. In the film, an American veteran claims that in 2002, while serving as a part of a squad of U.S. soldiers in the mountains of Kandahar province in Afghanistan, he encountered a 12 fingered giant with intense red hair, armed with a spear and a shield that stood four to five meters tall. The year is 2002. A squadron of U.S. soldiers went missing in Afghanistan without warning, and drones sent out to locate them found nothing, so the command dispatched the second squadron to their last known location with the task of finding the missing soldiers. This team included the American soldier who was interviewed about the events in Watcher 10 by L. A. Marzulli. However, he was interviewed by others than Marzulli. Years later, he appeared as a guest on a paranormal podcast, which I will link in the description, and gave a fairly detailed interview about the events. The following is a clip from the podcast. Well, uh, anybody who hasn't heard it, it is on Watchers 10. I was interviewed by L.A. Marzulli, and uh, a group went out the day before, and they didn't hit a rally point. They didn't hit a checkpoint didn't give uh, information back to command and you know stuff happens radios go down whatever well they sent birds out looking for them nothing uh so they sent a second team i happened to be on that second team and what we did is we followed their exact route because as you know when you're going somewhere you always leave something with battalion hq or whatever to let people know where you're going to be and, and you mark your rally points, checkpoints <clears throat> off in specific times when you're going to do it. Um, the cave was offset, so it wasn't directly in front of us, even though it sort of made an L, this part of the mountainside. It was a sheer drop there. And instead of it facing directly towards us or directly to the left of us as we're coming around that turn, it was like diagonal to us right there. If you imagine the the corner of the L, that would be where it would be. And then there was a sheer drop off behind us. There was rocks. You know, it is in Afghanistan. Uh, there was an oddity though, is we saw these bones. <clears throat> and then I saw a piece of our equipment. As I get into it, you'll understand what I mean. Anyways. All of a sudden, with the quickness, dude, speed, you would not believe this thing jumped out. And I'm not joking when I say, I know this to be a fact, too. He was 15 feet tall. Yeah, we're super shocked. And uh, my one bro, who was a SEAL, we called him Dan the Man. It's the only person's name I use because the rest of them are still alive. If they want to come out with a story, they'll do it when they want to. He broke he broke first everybody will pause on certain things and that was something that we all paused on but he broke first uh and he, he even went at him and we all started to move too but this thing was so quick it had skewered dan on a uh, pike and uh everybody starts yelling to shoot him in the face shoot him in the face and uh we all open up this story has taken longer than it actually took. It was probably 30 seconds total time. And that's a, that's a long time. So we start hitting him. And uh, he, he finally goes down. 
when he does, um, you know, basically what I believe happened, we all know about David and Goliath. Uh, just like after David killed Goliath, he severed the head with his sword, right? And yes. from our shooting, we basically took everything from his lower jaw, the artwork they had done. The guy got several things wrong with the artwork, but, you know, they cost them a lot of money and they weren't going to redo it. But we basically blew a big gaping hole through his head with our, with our rounds. And uh, where we hit the body, we noticed that the team from the night before must have hit the body too because it was already starting to heal just from our engagement. This is after he's down. Dan's we've already tried to stabilize him, and he was he, he passed. And uh. So the night line just became a, a pickup. The basic gist of it is uh, uh, I believe that we severed where the brain and the spinal cord meet. He said, did he have double rows of teeth? I said, look, I'd be lying to you if I told you for sure he had double rows uh, because our bullets had impacted so much. There were teeth going inward and outward, and I don't know if it was the bullets or that was just the way his teeth mm. were made. This is all stuff that I'm just trying to fill you in on the minutia that didn't get put in into the film. Um... It did look like the boys from the night before or the day before uh, had engaged him because his wounds were already being were already healing. Next, the facts were from the night before, the day before, you could tell where he'd been hit. He had that's where they messed up on the uh, artwork, and it wasn't their fault. It was the guy who did the artwork. All he had was like a loincloth on him. And he did have one odd thing that still blows me away to this day. He had a shield, like a Roman squared uh, rectangular shield. And uh, both of the things he had were made out of brass. He smelled as persistent as a skunk, but like, I don't know if, how many of you guys have been in combat or been to a mass graves opening, but the smell of uh, the king flesh I guess is the best way to describe his stench red hair so red it was like fire red brother I'm looking at it now in my mind sorry um, he had six fingers six toes he was barefooted uh, anyways so we go into uh, the cave we saw different things but you know was it a was it something he was smelting Brass in. I don't know. Was it his cook pot? I don't know. But uh, we did find fresh bones, and and that was from the team the night before. And that didn't make mm. it. He did have clothes, like a, I guess you would call it a tunic. And uh, he did have like these weird shoes that were like must have been sheep's skin. When I say that, I mean literally ripped off of the sheep, and then he just tied them up by poking holes <clears throat> through, the, through the actual skin and just tying them up that way. They, they were real funky looking, almost, I don't know how to explain it. They, they, you could tell they were handmade. Anyway, so we go in there and we're looking around. We see some of his stuff. By then, the helicopter had come and we flew back to uh, the air base in Afghanistan. Uh, we were there when they brought him down, and they had uh, they had these special uh, forklifts that moved those flat pieces of uh, aluminum that you put cargo on, and they brought that out <clears throat> to where there was an aircraft. Uh, they had already loaded him, started loading him down, and then dropped, it, you know, taking him out towards the aircraft. We landed. Uh, we went over there. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, Coast to Coast AM American Radio interviewed a pilot in 2008 who claimed to have been involved in transporting the giant's body to America in a C-130 military cargo plane. Unfortunately, I don't have access to the section where this interview takes place, but a brief excerpt is shown in the Marzulli film. 
The Kandahar giant was featured in a video by the YouTube channel Strange But True Stories in May 2017. A user named Tony Baldwin commented, claiming that his brother was involved in the Afghan war and was part of a team sent to investigate the giant's cave. According to his brother, the cave was littered with human and animal bones. The cave stank so bad that gas masks were worn during the search and there was a large amount of excrement at the cave's end. The cave, according to the brother, was full of weapons of all kinds, including old swords, crossbows, and bearded rifles, as well as modern firearms and explosives, presumably taken from the people the giant had killed. If this post is true, it could suggest that these creatures can live for hundreds of years. Of course, the question is whether there have been any other giant sightings in Afghanistan that could lend credence to the Kandahar giant story. The guest on episode 145 of the Blurry Creatures podcast was a U.S. soldier who served in Afghanistan. They went on a reconnaissance mission in Kunar province with a few men from a squad in the spring of 2009. According to his account, he was scanning the surrounding mountains at night in thermal imaging mode with his reconnaissance equipment when he noticed a large heat sign on one of the mountains that he couldn't quite place due to its size. He initially assumed it was a group of Taliban fighters or herders huddled around a fire and decided to keep an eye on them. However, the heat sign, which he assumed were multiple people around the campfire, suddenly increased. According to the soldier, the trees in that area grow four to five meters tall, and this heat sign towered over them. According to him, what he saw mostly resembled a long-haired, bearded, very tall, thin, naked man. What scared him the most was that the giant was staring at his squad, which was strange and frightening because they were about 500 to 600 meters away. It was nighttime, and the chances of a human seeing them with the naked eye from that distance were slim. The creature then stood up and left. Aside from this podcast, I discovered a couple of reports of giants in Afghanistan in the comments section of various YouTube videos. I realized they aren't the most convincing evidence, but I thought I'd bring them up. But how does this all connect to Gog and Magog? For this, we need to know the Hungarian origin myth, which was perpetuated by a 13th century priest named Shimon of Kiesa, in his Gesta Hungarorum. According to the story, in the 201st year after the flood, Nimrod, spelled Minrot in the original text, the giant was born, the son of Thana, Japheth, and Noah himself. Nimrod began construction on the Tower of Babel in case the flood occurred ever again so that people could seek refuge there and survive. However, due to God mixing up the tongues, the tower was never completed. The story itself describes the tower. Quote, According to Josephus, they built temples of the gods of the purest gold, palaces of precious stones, golden pillars, and streets of more precious stones than those that are otherwise paved in the said tower. And that tower was raised to four angles, 15,000 paces from one corner to the other. The length was the same. The height was not yet finished but it was intended to be raised to the circumference of the moon, which the flood could not overtake. Its base was 300 paces thick, but as it rose it gradually narrowed, so that the thickness of its base could bear the weight that pressed against it, and its walls were built in a place between Nubia and Egypt. Its ruins can still be seen today near the road, going from Memphis to Alexandria. Close quote. Nimrod then relocated to Persia, where he had several children, the most important of whom were Gog and Magog, or Hunor and Magor in the original text. When the two boys went hunting one day, they came across a wondrous stag, which they chased all the way to the swamps of Motis, which are today's Azov Sea and the Crimean Peninsula, where they decided to settle with their people. When Gog and Magog's people had multiplied there, they poured out onto the Eurasian steppe, conquered it, and founded Scythia which was divided into three kingdoms, Bashkiria, Dent, and Hungary. Obviously, you're wondering what all this has to do with the Kandahar Colossus. The House of Arpad, the first dynasty in Hungary, traced their paternal lineage back to Nimrod the Giant, and red hair was surprisingly common among them. 
we do know that St. Piroshka of Byzantium, Queen Constance of Bohemia, Queen Mary of Naples, and St. Elizabeth all had red hair. This is an intriguing coincidence. By the way, Queen Mary of Naples had 14 children, all of whom had red hair, as shown in this medieval illustration. Furthermore, few people are aware that the people with the highest proportion of redheads are not Irish, but Utmorts living on Russian territory, mostly in the Utmort Republic. It is worth noting that the Bashkir Republic is located next to the Utmort Republic, and Shimon of Keza had previously named Bashkiria as one of Scythia's kingdoms. The Irish, however, were not left out of the Scythian connection. In the early Middle Ages, St. Bede, an English monk, wrote the history of the English people in his Chronicle of the English, where he made the following observation. Quote, At first the Britons were the only inhabitants of the island, which got its name from them. They are said to have arrived in Britain from the province of Armorica and occupied the southern parts of the island, which bears their name. Following that, the Picts arrive on ships from Scythia and scaled around the entire British coast until they arrived in Ireland. Close quote. Could the red hair have resulted from interbreeding with giants somewhere in ancient Scythia? Another interesting fact about the Kandahar giant is found in pre-Christian Hungarian folklore. Having six fingers was a sign of divine election, and such children became holy men known as the Tatosh, which is a sort of shaman. What could be the source of this custom? Modern Afghanistan, by the way, was once a part of Scythia. In the 10th century, Ahmad ibn Fadlan was an Arab traveler who encountered the Volga Bulgars. He claims that the Khan there showed him the body of a giant, 12 elbows or about 5.5 to 6 meters tall, who was discovered in a river there by locals and later hanged for murder. This is how ibn Fadlan describes the encounter in his book, The Land of the Shadow. Quote, He rode with me into the forest filled with immense trees and shoved me towards a tree under which had fallen his bones and head. I saw his head. It was like a giant beehive. His ribs were like the stalk of a date cluster, and the bones of his legs and arms were enormous too. I was astonished at the sight. Close quote. Bulgarians traditionally consider themselves to be descended from the Scythian Empire as well. But he was not the only Arab traveler to report such a tale. Abu Hamid, who lived in the 12th century, claimed to have seen two living giants in the other Bulgaria. This is mentioned in his book. Quote, in Bulgar, in the year 530, 1136, I saw a man of the race of Ad, more than seven cubits tall. He was called Dankwa. He was so strong that he could carry a horse under his arm as if it were a goat. He could also crush the leg of a horse and cut through its nerves with his hand as if it were a bundle of herbs. The king of Bulgar ordered a cuirass made for him, which he used to transport in a cart and a helmet the size of a huge cauldron. He fought with the trunk of an oak, which he brandished with his right hand as if it were a walking stick. He could have killed an elephant with a single blow. Despite all of this, he was an extremely modest person. When we met, and my head didn't even reach his belt. He used to greet me, make me welcome, and heap honors upon me. May God have mercy upon him. There wasn't a bathhouse in the whole city big enough for him to enter, except one, which had very big doors. He was the most extraordinary man I have seen in my life. He had a sister as big as he was, whom I saw several times in Bulgar. In that city, the Kadi Yaqub ibn Numan informed me that this woman, so exceedingly tall, had killed her husband, who was named Adam and was one of the strongest men in the country. Clasping him to her bosom, she broke his ribs, killing him instantly. Close quote. For those who don't know, the tribe of Ad was a nation of giants in the Quran. In any case, Abu Hamid makes no mention of the giant's hair color or the fact that they had twelve fingers. 
Speaking of fingers, I have a theory about the Kandahar giant that I haven't heard anywhere else. Because we have 10 fingers, we like to align our systems to the number system 10. Even as a child, I thought it odd that this was not true for our time-related systems. What we need to know about these systems is that they were passed down from the ancient Sumerian Empire, and no one knows where they came from. In addition, a statue of Gilgamesh, the legendary Sumerian king, has survived, depicting him with an adult lion. Everyone is free to reach their own conclusions based on it. Anyway, our timekeeping systems are based on the numbers 6 and 12. A minute is 5 times 12, or 60 seconds. An hour is 5 times 12, or 60 minutes. One day is 2 times 12, or 24 hours. One month is 5 times 6, or 30 days. And one year is divided into 12 months. The only element that does not fit is the week, which cannot be divided by 6. I think the creation of these systems is more logical if we assume that the creator of the system had 12 fingers and not 10. Just a thought.